Good question. So um, we can adopt what's known as a Wittgensteinian approach to semantics. What do we mean by money? Well, if it's how people use the word is the meaning. There's no sort of platonic thing that the word money points to and that's it. It's how we use the word. Um, and from us, from our point of view, the money users, they are, the new numbers are new money. Um, we spend them, use them, that, that is our medium of exchange. They, once somebody's borrowed them, then they start circulating in the economy. The, the guy who sold you the house, he gets the 100,000, he probably buys a new car with it, or he goes on holiday, or whatever. Now there's a flip side to that expansion of the um, bank's balance sheet when somebody comes along and uh, repays their loan, pays money back to the bank. And in this case, the money supply contracts. Um, let's see that schematically. Here's the balance sheet. The dotted lines are before the event and uh, the solid lines are both before and after. So when the guy comes in with these 100,000, well, he probably doesn't these days, he probably does it electronically, but when this event of debt repayment happens, then the effect on the balance sheet is that the loan account is paid off, so it disappears. It's obviously some historic record of it is kept somewhere, but the day-to-day -day accounting of the bank, that loan has gone. And on the other side of the balance sheet, the customer's cu current account has gone down by 100,000. So we see the two sides now have shrunk, just in the opposite way to when they expanded when the loan was taken out. So after a while, the bank's been trading, and what does its balance sheet look like in general? Again, this is very schematic. Um, well, we've seen that the customer's deposits are liabilities to the bank. The loans taken out by customers are assets to the bank. Here they are. You'll notice the loans are a bit bigger than the deposits in this uh, diagram. That's because, as we'll see, interest is charged on those loans. They have a certain internal dynamic. They, you take your eye off them and they grow. Um, another asset to the bank is physical cash called vault cash. This is the bank does actually keep some notes and coins in in its safe in its vault and that is an asset to the bank. So we notice the difference between um, electronic money and physical money here that whoever actually has ownership of physical cash that's an asset to that entity be it the bank or uh, people outside the bank. Um, assets, financial assets, the banks. The banks tend to buy gilts, which are IOUs from the British government. It's a favourite asset of banks. And obviously the nice buildings that you see and uh, the cars and so on and so forth. And also, remember, initially the shareholders put their initial money into the uh, account at the Bank of England, who is called their reserve account. We'll have a look at the structure of this a bit more detail later. So that's an asset to the bank. So the bank has its money in the central bank, the Bank of England. The bank's customers have their money in the commercial bank. And on the commercial bank's balance sheet, the bank's money is an asset and the customer's deposits is a liability. Um, other liabilities that banks have, well, they have all the usual expenses of any business, uh, they owe tax, they have to pay electricity bills, etc., etc. But and like any business, they have this shareholder's capital account, which is a number on the liability side of their balance sheet, and it represents something quite important. It's what the shareholders would get were the bank to be wound up now. The bank would call in all its assets, pay off all its liabilities, and with any luck, there'd be something left over for the shareholders to take away. Because the shareholders came in at the beginning with a certain amount of money. They've traded for a while. They might want to 
stop trading now and walk away with some loot. So that's where it accumulates in their shareholders' capital account. So we've now seen where this electronic money comes from, how it gets into circulation, how it comes into being. And looking back, you can see that bit by bit, in the past, it's all been borrowed into existence by somebody. And these people out there who, or some in here probably, who borrowed these digits into existence, got them into the banking system, they're paying interest on them. So every electronic pound going round and round the economy, some poor so-and-so somewhere is paying interest on it. So that means that if you think of the whole money supply, or you know the, the electronic bulk of it, which is more or less all of it these days, then that money supply, that medium of exchange, is actually on loan to us. Um, it has no permanence. It doesn't go round and round within the community of money users. It's lent to them by this rather strange banking system. So the conclusion is we actually rent our currency, our medium of exchange, from the bank, from the banking system, through these interest-bearing loans. And that's weird, isn't it, when you think about it? These numbers, they charge us for using their numbers, which cost them nothing to type in. Well, yeah, my numbers are as good as <laughs> their numbers. As a mathematician, I must say this. Um, so why do I have to, why am I forced to rent their numbers? So I like the phrase that we have a renter currency system. Um, let's look at it schematically. Well, here's us in the economy. These arrows mean the money's going round and round. And what goes round and round up there is digits in banks' computers. And none of it is debt-free and none of it is permanent. Um, it's all temporary, transient, ephemeral. And it comes into the economy, as we've seen from interest-bearing commercial loans, and it drains back out of the economy as the loans plus, plus the interest. Um, so the banks extract wealth from the economy by renting to us a bunch of numbers. It's quite a good business, isn't it? <laughs> Um, and of course the numbers they get back as interest are just as good as any other numbers and they can spend those numbers back into the economy. And, you know, you'll notice bankers have pretty good cars and bonuses and houses and so on. All for buildings, oh, yeah, I mean, they accumulate a lot of wealth by charging us to use their numbers. Hmm. What's the alternative? Well, we could do it this way. Here's us in the economy, and instead of using <coughs> numbers which are lent to us by commercial banks, we could have our own numbers, could issue them collectively, all of us. And we, they could be permanent. Um, and the money supply could go round and round indefinitely as we conduct our business. Where, where would that sort of money come from? Well, it can only come from the collective, from the whole community of money users. You don't want any privileged minority doing it and making lots of profit out of it, let's do it all together. You know, we're all going to use this, these numbers. Well, let's have our own numbers. Fine. So we issue them into the economy and through what's called the state, which is taking a benevolent look at it. It's what we all want to do collectively together. We all have nice roads and we all want to drive on the same side of the road and so on. So I'm just having a dig at the anarchists here, who uh, often I debate with on the internet. Um, so collectively, we can provide our own medium of exchange, our own bunch of numbers, at negligible cost. You know, you have to pay some guy to type them in, sure, but it's not a big expense. So that's the alternative which we're all working towards. Let's not um, knock debt-based money per se, we're just, we're just knocking commercially issued debt-based money. But there is an argument um, that any money system needs to be a bit flexible. 
needs to expand and contract. You know, if somebody invents a new widget and suddenly lots of factories are needed to produce these new wonder widgets, well, we need a bit more money in the economy. Well, we can still do that. We, we collectively, through the state, can lend money into the economy as well as spend money into the economy. So it's not a problem. This is a counter-argument to um, 